Well, first of all, welcome to Providence. My name is Scott McConnell and I am the clinical educator for respiratory care. And I am going to be giving you an introduction to our department and how it functions and how we can help you. So the uh, leadership breakdown for our department includes our uh, director, which is Carl Hinkson, and uh, Don Coleman, our manager, who works during the day. And we also have a clinical supervisor, uh, that would be Lindsay Howell, but she only works at night. Uh, we do not have a uh, clinical supervisor during the day, so um, the roles that she would, that would a uh, clinical supervisor would take during the day would have to be broken down into uh, uh, Dawn, the manager, and of course my, myself, the clinical educator, depending on the type of uh, um, inf uh, in issues that might arise. Uh, the most important person on this list of, is actually the lead therapist. The lead therapist does the meat and potatoes of, of our everyday work here, here at the Respiratory Care Department. Um, the lead um, we, is a therapist that is designated on each shift they will create the assignments for, for the day. So each therapist will be assigned to a particular area. They uh, hand out phones to each of those individual therapists. Um, they, um, uh, they are Spectralinks at this point. We are trying to transition over to iPhones, but that may take some time. Uh, the uh, phones sadly will not be the same number necessarily for every area each day uh, because th it, how we hand out those phones will of course be determined by what the, the caseload is for one floor versus another so, and that changes from day to day. Um, the uh, the uh, um, therapists that uh, break down for each each area is will change from day to day but in, in general there will be one to two therapists that are, will, be, will be working in the ICUs they'll be uh, in the A tower which is the older part of our building there's usually one or two therapists they um, uh, as a rule if there's more than one therapist for that tower they will probably split between uh, the D tower, you know, the big new building and the old tower, so they'll be traveling back and forth. And we also have um, uh, one therapist that is designated for the emergency department. And the emergency department is quite large, there's 90 or so beds, so that does actually keep that person pretty busy. Um, now, a caveat to this is, uh, you know, we are in a, uh, a kind of an unusual time and uh, r given the, uh, the workloads these days, there are actually more along the lines of four to five therapists in the intensive care units. And there might only be one therapist that are, that are taking care of the general uh, uh, nursing care floors because so much of the routine has, uh, has dropped off due to our uh, focus on uh, the uh, intensive, intensive care areas and uh, fo focusing away from um, um, just you know general care. So nursing has been you know picking up quite of this quite a bit of the slack for for respiratory in that area. Um, we also have a respiratory equipment tech who is uh, very important to us. Uh, when she's not there, we know it. Uh, she will uh, handle all our supplies, ordering, uh, divvying it out. Uh, she cleans equipment for us. Uh, she, d she really does a lot. And uh, uh, when she's not there, we spend a great deal of our, uh, our patient care time is spent in handling equipment issue issues. So we love her. And that would be uh, Misty Lotta. Um, now, as for shifts, the way our shifts work, um, we also have a half hour report off time, just like you do, um, but we do that from 6 to 6.30. Uh, we do that because we want to take all the good parking spaces before you get here. Uh, but uh, <laughs> aside from that, during that 30 minute period of time, 
uh, we do have, just like you, we're kind of taken up in, in reporting off on our patients. Uh, we do report off on a substantially larger number of patients than, than you might. Um, we, our patient load could be 20, 30 different people. Granted, it's not as extensive as yours, but still with the, with the number, it does keep us busy for that 30 minute period of time. And uh, we just uh, caution you that if you try to call us during that time, um, you, uh, you may have to repeat yourself. Uh, because the person you're talking to may not be the person that uh, shows up to uh, help you. So uh, just uh, be patient and uh, d you know you might expect a little bit of a delay during that period unless it's a real emergency. Um, we also uh, carry spectral link phones uh, so you will be able to call your therapist directly whenever you need them. Um, we do also ask that um, you don't try to call the lead therapist during um, during our uh, uh, to get those numbers uh, because uh, there's a lot of you and if you're all doing that it takes up a lot of their time. There is a uh, uh, thing called Tower Central and uh, the lead therapists actually upload the list of therapists and the phone numbers so you can be able, so you'll be able to look that up and find out who's taking care of your patient at any time. Um, so contact. I've put the uh, the lead therapist number in there. That is the one number that is never going to change. That's always the same. Four four five two four, um, and that'll get you to your uh, your uh, lead therapist. That be the second one second one down on this list. Um, if you have an actual issue, the first place you need to go is to, to the therapist that's assigned to your floor. Uh, if it's beyond that, that person, it would go to the lead. And um, the lead should be able to answer or, or fix whatever issue might, might arise. They are basically our content experts. Uh, if for some reason the, the lead therapist can't figure, figure out what's going on, then of course we'll go on to the, uh, the supervisor or, or educator, depending on what's, what the need is. And of course, because we have a day shift, night shift thing, it could be the manager. Um, going to the director, yeah, probably not, you know, it, it's, it's, um, most issues are gonna be resolved uh, by someone below him, so he would be assigning it to someone below him anyway. Um, so uh, uh, again, the most important thing, your therapist, if not that therapist, then the lead. Um, you know, the, any of the calls that you are going to be sending to your therapist, if, even if they don't pick up the phone, it gets routed directly to the lead. So that's, that's your loop. Uh, protocols, we don't have a lot of protocols. Uh, but our biggest and most encompassing protocol would be the assess and treat protocol. The assess and treat protocol handles uh, f uh, with our adult patients anything uh, from uh, aerosolized medications to uh, uh, lung recruitment to uh, um, uh, uh, airway clearance. Okay, so. Um, and a, a big takeaway from this protocol is that uh, there are ways that it, it can be initiated. The physician can just order the um, assess and treat protocol and we will come, we will assess the patient, we will determine what that patient needs as a therapy to make them better. Um, the thing you really need to know is that there are other ways that this can be uh, generated. And one of those ways is to order nebulizer therapies. So if you order nebulizer therapies or the physician orders nebulizer therapies, that automatically places them on this protocol. So do not be surprised that if an order for a nebulizer gets turned into something else, because if we come along and we find that your patient is post-op and they have post-op atelectasis, we will probably not treat them with a nebulizer. We will probably treat them with a therapy that will help them to re-recruit their lungs. Um, that could, uh, you know, fall into a, a multiple, you know, different uh, uh, modalities that we might, might use. Um, and 
that pretty much covers the assess and treat protocol. The asthma protocol, which is a pediatric protocol, um, it encompasses patients from the emergency department on through admission. Um, it uh, takes into consideration nursing care as well. Uh, when a patient comes into the emergency department, we have uh, certain standards that we want to maintain and we're trying to improve upon. Um, we expect that our patients with at, uh, pediatric patients with asthma would get their steroids within 60 minutes of walking through the door. That's not 60 minutes from the time they're placed in a room, but from the time they walk in the door. And uh, we uh, concentrate most of our um, therapies for the, these patients on, a, uh, on MDIs. So we try not to do aerosolized therapies with them. Uh, we choose to do MDIs, uh, not only because they're uh, just as effective, if not more effective, than aerosol therapies, but because it also allows us the opportunity to uh, teach the patients how to use those uh, devices correctly. It also uh, helps them in their everyday life, not having to drag around an, an aerosol generator when they can just stick in an MDI in their pocket. Um, uh, bronchiolitis is another protocol that we have. It's also pediatric. Um, you know, uh, when we talk about bronchiolitis, um, one thing you have to keep in mind is that this is a disease of uh, hydration and airway clearance. So we no longer treat these patients with aerosolized medications. Uh, predominantly what we're going to do is just get the fluids into them and to uh, maintain a clear airway. Uh, the problem with bronchiolitis is uh, not the actual virus itself, but what it causes. And what it causes for patients that are generally under two years of age um, is dehydration. The, uh, they uh, stop feeding normally. When they stop eat feeding normally, then they don't get enough fluids, they become dehydrated. They then become lethargic and they don't feed as strongly and they get weak and it's just a vicious circle. So we just need to reverse that circle, rehydrate them, make them stronger so they can feed better and then we can, and, and get their, the secretions out of their lungs and send them home. Uh, you know, one of the things you need to know about bronchiolitis is that it's not, it, it, they will not be perfect when, when they go. We will get to them, them to the point where they're back to feeding normally and then, then they go home. 24 to 48 hours. Uh, but just like you and I, uh, when you have some, a bad cold, you know, you're over the cold, you still have that creeping crud that is going to last afterwards. So your breath sounds are not going to be clear either. Uh, so there you go. Uh, so that's it for our mo for our protocols right now. There are a few other protocols that you'll find as we go as you work here, but uh, uh, they're uh, more specific. Um, so one of the big things we do is uh, deliver med oxygen. Um, you will do this, and we will do this. Um, the thing to remember about oxygen is that is it is a drug. Um, and hence, we need to get an order for this medication. Uh, that is not to say that we are not going to start this without consulting a physician. This is, this is a drug that is emergent. Uh, we do not want you to wait for a physician to call back to start you know, oxygen on a patient that is a SAT of 40%. Uh, so we want you to start the oxygen and we're happy that you do, and we will do it as well, but we do need to contact the physician and get an order. Now, does, not only does that cover us legally, but it also informs the physician as to the condition of their patient. Okay. So how do we get oxygen into our patient? Um, here you're gonna see uh, di several different uh, devices that will uh, deliver oxygen at least deliver oxygen to one of the devices that we're going to place on our patient. Um, the first one, of course, is what we call a Thorpe tube. Uh, it's the kind of oxygen flow meter you see every day. 
Uh, it, uh, this one, and one in particular ranges from you know, zero to 15 liters. Um, you can push it past the 15 liters, it'll go to flush, it'll make a lot more noise, you'll know. Uh, keep in mind though that the color on these devices is green. That means oxygen, so please be aware anytime you see something that isn't green, it isn't oxygen. So uh, like uh, if you see one that looks just like this but it's yellow, what's going to be coming out of that is air, not oxygen. Just keep that in mind. Okay, the second one on this slide um, is uh, also a uh, flow meter that goes from 1 to 15 liters, or 0 to 15 liters. Uh, the black knob on the top of this uh, actually clicks, so we, they call this a click flow meter. So you will just turn the black knob on the top and the number in that little window will change. Um, you will see this more often than not in the uh, FMC uh, or uh, Pavilion for Women and Children, they have a lot of these flow meters. There are just a few that sometimes uh, pop up over here on the Colby campus. The uh, third one on here, which is attached to a tank, is what we call a grab and go. This is actually a tank of oxygen and it works very much like the click flow meter. There's a white knob on the top. And if you turn that, you can turn it to whatever flow you might want on this. It can actually also be turned to an auxiliary setting that will allow it to run at a high pressure, which would uh, feed a uh, ventilator uh, or something like that. Um, one thing I do want to point out about the uh, first two flow meters on here is that uh, you need to pay attention to the numbers on these. They uh, they, they can look exactly the same, but they can have different ranges. Um, both the, the click and the Thorpe tube could actually be limited to zero to a maximum of only one liter per minute. Or another one might only go up to three liters per minute, and, and we have some that go up to 85. So uh, just pay attention to those numbers. Um, so our uh, the interfaces that we're going to attach to our patients would start with a nasal cannula. This is the lowest level of support you would be delivering to your patient. Um, there is a, a chart here that just lists the potential amounts of oxygen you can deliver with a particular flow. Uh, don't try to memorize that. Um, that is just giving you a general idea of how much oxygen a nasal cannula can deliver. Um, and we will not go up past uh, six liters on these uh, on, on a nasal cannula. Uh, generally, or not generally, uh, we do not supply the uh, bubble bottles that you may be used to seeing with nasal cannulas. Um, they are meant to deliver some form of humidity into the nasal cannula. The uh, amount of humidity is relatively inconsequential, so we do not supply them. Uh, the nursing care floors themselves actually do keep a stock of them. Uh, so uh, you can use these if you wish, but uh, if you were to call us, we would not be able to supply them to you. Uh, if you do turn these up much above six liters with one of those bottles, they'll start to whistle, uh, telling you to stop it. And uh, the, uh, the, they're generally square, and they will turn round. <laughs> when you uh, if you turn them up too high, okay. Or they may actually at some points spray water at you too. Um, uh, the next step step up would be a simple mask. Simple mask is exactly what it looks like. It's just a mask with a some oxygen tubing tech, uh, connected up to it. We don't tend to use them very often anymore. They are. Uh, they will deliver about 40 to 60 percent oxygen. They must have at least six liters of gas flowing to them. That, for that, the reason for that is that if you have less than that, you, it, there will not be enough gas going through the mask to clear the CO2 that your patient is exhaling. So you must have six liters, and keep in mind you cannot wean a patient off of a simple mask. You either have it on at six liters or more, or you take it off. Okay, so you cannot wean this. All right, and uh, 
we don't see a lot of them anymore. Um, FMC, FMC used to use them, and I, I don't believe that they're using them much anymore either. Okay, so um, a more refined device would be the Venturi mask. The Venturi mask allows for um, better fine tuning of the uh, oxygen to lever, lit, uh, level we're delivering. It um, has a huge drawback in that it is very intimidating when you open this package. This package comes with so many pieces and parts it usually causes people that don't use it a lot a lot of problems. What I would I want you to know is that there's no time that you would ever have to set this device up in an emergency. So if it confuses you, use something else. This um, this device is also not something we would by preference use for lo for long term. It's. Uh, it's still a, a large amount of flow. It's very dry. It's not particularly comfortable. Um, if you look on the, this slide at the left, you'll see the mask and you'll see a green tube with a green nipple on it. That nipple comes off and it can be changed out for the white one. When you switch those out, you can change the amount of oxygen or the ranges of oxygen you can get. Not only do you switch out those, those nipples, but you actually rotate them. You know, so they each one of those nipples has a range of oxygen. But what you have to pay attention to is there's some writing on them and a little arrow. You're pointing to the oxygen you want, and it also tells you how much flow you have to dial in on the flow meter that you have connected to it. So you have to pay attention to both of those things. And then, of course, there's that little green thing sitting off the side. You can probably throw that away. Uh, it's just, you know, some extras. Uh, on the left, you're just seeing a, uh, a Venturi t device used on a T-piece that might be a ta ta um, attached to a trach. Um, the race range of oxygen for these devices can go from uh, like 24% oxygen up to, I believe, 48% oxygen. But again, um, this is not something that you're going to have to, you know, do in the heat of the moment. You're, you, there are other devices that you would do use use in, instead of that. Okay. Uh, the highest thing, you know, a level of oxygen you're going to get is from a non-rebreather mask. So, if you have have a patient that comes in, they need a little bit of oxygen. You're going to use your na nasal cannula. If you have an emergency and your your patient sets are dropping, put them on a non-rebreather. Okay. Those two things; those are the most important things you have, tools you have. Uh, the non-rebreather can deliver uh, anywhere from 90 to uh, 80 to 100 percent oxygen. Uh, odds are you're never going to get to 100 percent oxygen. It's just not a closed system. Uh, things to remember: you want to have at least 15 liters of gas flowing to this. If the bag that you're seeing on this mask is not inflating or doesn't stay inflated you need more flow. So despite the fact that you're at the highest level of flow you can see on this flow meter, turn up the knob higher until that bag, bag stays filled. Uh, the other thing that you want to take note of, if you see on the right side, you see a little bit closer picture of, of the uh, mask. Um, on the uh, right side of that you'll see kind of a little disc on the side of that mask. That disc is covering some holes that are poked in the side. And on the opposite side, there's some holes that are poked in there, and they're not covered at all. The idea is that creates kind of a one-way valve. Gas, when, when exhaled, can go out through those holes, and then when they breathe back in, it closes. So the, you, the patient has to get all the oxygen from the, that reservoir bag and from the inflow of oxygen from, from the wall. Okay. Uh, there are some masks that may still be floating around that have two of those flaps on them. We want to make sure that they don't have two of those flaps. Because if your oxygen line gets, gets disconnected and they exhale and they try to inhale again and those valves close, they can't get in the air. 
Okay, so you, you need they need to be able to get something in an emergency. And those valves are on there just because we want to limit how much we're diluting the oxygen with the gas in the room. Okay, so the room air. Okay, so most important thing, a little bit of oxygen, nasal cannula, a lot of oxygen, non rebreather. So uh, here, uh, kind of an alternative, you say your patient has a, a tra tracheostomy. This device that's uh, screwed on the top of this water bottle, it's another form of a venturi. Um, and uh, so it actually has a dial on it that we can dial at a level, levels of, different levels of oxygen. And um, this is a little bit more tolerable than the mask itself because it's attached to this water bottle, which creates an aerosol. So uh, your patients that have trachs, they, we've bypassed their ability to humi humidify the gas that we're delivering. So aerosolizing some, some fluid and uh, while we deliver even just room air, these can be attached to just room air or anything, uh, you know, be up to almost 50% oxygen with this is uh, going to keep those secretions that are inevitably going to dry from doing that. Okay. So uh, moving away from oxygen delivery devices, um, we want to know how we get our medications into our patients. I mean, this is what we, a lot of what we do. Um, this is the most simple device that we have. It's a, a small volume nebulizer. Uh, generally runs um, around eight liters per minute. Uh, a general uh, uh, treatment will probably take 10 to 15 minutes to deliver. Uh, it is not the most efficient means of giving these medications. An MDI would probably be better. Um, we, do the, we do have one issue. We've had people that have just been doing and taking their medications the way they have all their lives. So it's very difficult to get them to switch over from one to the other. Uh, and sometimes it's just not possible for them to coordinate MDIs. You know, they just don't have the physical ability to do so. So we do use these. Um, they can be used with mouthpiece or mask. Uh, you'll see the mouthpiece on the right side. And it has a, some tubing on it. It's a reservoir. Uh, that reservoir is uh, kind of serves the same purpose as the bag that's on a non-rebreather bag. It's collecting up some of the of the medication, so we have less uh, just air pulled into the room and some you know more of that medication. Okay, so a more uh, um, efficient means to deliver a medication is this Eclipse Neb, which is actually what we call a BAM, or Breath Actuated Nebulizer. And uh, the uh, beauty of this device is that it will uh, only nebulize when the patient takes a breath. So when they breathe in, it nebulizes. When they are talking with their hands or having a conversation with their friends, it's not going to do anything. It's not going to waste that medication. Okay. Also, the particle size created by this device is much better than the other one. So the deposition of the medication is, is greater. So it's an all-around better device. So why do we just why do we use the other device? Well, you know, the other device might cost 50 cents, then this one might cost five dollars. So for routine patients, they don't have asthma. You know, they maybe they just have COPD and they t just take routine therapies, but without you know an acute attack of, of some kind, those other devices are fine. Okay. Uh, now these days we have we, we love our technology, uh, so we have this uh, thing called an aerogen, uh, which is a vibrating mesh nebulizer. So this. Uh, device will actually create a mist that the patient can breathe. It requires no gas flow. Uh, it just literally uh, vibrates a mesh and breaks up the, uh, the medication into little particles. They're perfectly sized. They, uh, they will uh, deposit medication in a lung at a much greater percentage than either one of those other devices. Uh, it does require, uh, you'll see down on kind of the, the bottom left there, um, our, uh, uh, it's like a controller box. So it runs on electricity. You press the button, it actually can run on a battery as well, of course. Um, and uh, 
you know, it delivers a medication that way. This can be delivered with uh, a mask as well, but uh, with a mask it does require a little bit of, o of oxygen or air, depending on what they are, what they're on, to just enough to push the, uh, the mist out of the container, which is only maybe one or two liters of flow. Okay, uh, currently uh, we're uh, using these uh, quite a bit for our, in the emergency department for our patients because it, uh, it is, uh, does decrease the, the amount of aerosolization that happens around our patient, which is, you know, one of those things that uh, will spread, you know, viral droplets and things like that. So we have been switching over to these. Um, so we've been talking about use of using MDIs. Uh, one of the things I want to stress is that uh, uh, our patients are going to get a much better medica uh, medication delivery if we use spacers. Um, not only does it uh, increase that deposition uh, just from you know uh, you know pulling it from from a from a container, but it um, it helps with the uncoordination of our patients. Um, it's for a lot of our patients. It's going to be very hard for them to actuate a nebulizer and then take a breath at the same time. Some patients have a hard time just squeezing them. Period. But to, to try to do that at the exact same time, as well as not um, just sticking their tongues in the way and things like that, um, it it's just it's just really hard for the for the patients to do this. The other thing is that when you actuate one of these MDIs, it comes out fast. When it hits the tongue, it hits the back of the throat. The medication sticks there, and that medication is lost. It's not function. It's not useful to the patient's lungs, because you want to be able to take in the medication a slow laminar flow, so it doesn't impact. It impacts the walls and objects in in your upper airways as little as possible. So, by using one of these spacers, which are hydrostatic, so the medication can't stick to the sides of them, what they the patient can do is they can shake their their nebulizer. They can put it on, stick it in their mouth, actuate it, and then after they've actuated into the container, they can then take a slow breath off of this device, nice and slow, kind of bypass the tongue, get, gets into the lungs, do a little breath hold to let it settle there before they exhale. Um, the other nice thing about these is that um, you'll notice that some of the ones on the, uh, on the kind of the right side bottom have masks attached. Those are for uh, pediatric patients, even infants. They're, these devices actually have uh, little flaps on the top of them, so you'll be able to see that the ba you know a baby or a child is actually get, getting a breath that'll flap back and forth as they breathe. Um, and um, what else do I want you to know about that? Oh, also that um, special for your adult patients, if they are taking two fast a breath, the uh, device will whistle. So if it whistles, you, you want to have them slow down. Okay. Now one of the reasons why I'm telling you so much about these is that uh, uh, we will try not to maintain um, our presence with patients that are using MDIs that know how to use them. So when we determine that they're capable of of using the MDIs on, on their own, we will change the frequency on those MDIs from an RT uh, time frame to a nursing one. So you might see an EPIC RTQ4. So that's a patient we're seeing. If it just says Q4, that's for you to do. Now I'm not saying that you have to do the MDI, but I, what it will mean is that you ha will have to supply the patient with their MDI so they can use it. Uh, so every four hours, you would have to make sure that they had that MDI available, and then you know put it back. You know because you're probably going to be keeping it in, a, in a, a patient's medication drawer or box or something like that. Okay. Uh, so um, in emergencies, 
we have what we call this is an ambu bag that is a that is actually a brand name uh, these are just self-inflating bags um, the beauty of these bags is that uh, regardless of having a gas source or not you can still ventilate a patient with these when you squeeze them they will reinflate on their own despite not having a gas source you won't be able to it'll just be room air that you're you're ventilating with but that's it's certainly better than nothing at all so you can actually initiate ventilation while you're waiting for a gas source to come along uh, behind you. If say this is an external uh, code on the sidewalk outside the hospital. Uh, these are not at every bedside. Uh, when you're on a nursing care floor, you're gonna find these on your crash carts, okay? Oh, one other thing I'll point out, and I can point it out on this next slide as well. Uh, you notice that coiled up uh, corrugated tubing on one end. Again, that's a reservoir. It works just like uh, your the, uh, the on, on the small volume nebulizer and the uh, uh, non breather. It uh, collects up the overgassing from the, from oxygen. So when we squeeze that bag, it pulls some oxygen in from the gas source as well as from that reservoir. If that wasn't on there, you'd only be able to get about 40 to 60 percent oxygen off this device. Um, with it, you can get 80 or more percent. Uh, this uh, particular bag happens to be hooked up to uh, an inline suction device. I know that most of you are probably going to be on, doing, on acute care floors versus intensive care units. Uh, this particular inline device is an inline suction catheter that can go on a trach. So we can actually do inline suction on tracheostomies, so um, it's much easier and quicker to uh, deal with those versus having to open up packages, putting on sterile gloves, and so forth. Um, these uh, suction catheters have sleeves on them, and they're hooked up to such, uh, su suction all the time. Uh, that uh, little white um, uh, button you see at one end one end of it, it you, by pressing that, it just applies suction after you've advanced it into their trach. Um, you know, uh, you might think that it's a respiratory therapist's job to suction, but sadly, we're not there all the time. And suctioning can be a life-saving uh, you know, intervention, so there are gonna be times when you're just going to have to do it. And uh, you're just, uh, you just need to make sure that, that you, when you go down there, you, uh, you have a general idea of how long the trach is. Just don't go a whole lot further than the end of that trach, because we don't wanna cause any irritation in the airway, okay? So, Further talking about suctioning, we uh, we tend to not want to use saline when we do suctioning, and the reason for that is that um, there is a belief that by instilling saline down into the airway, you would be washing bacteria uh, on the upper part of that airway back in, into the lower parts of that, that airway. So to decrease that potential for infection, we're going to reduce how much we do that. Now that said, there are times when it just has to be done. If the secretions have just gotten so thick and they block the airway, we have to get it out it, because the saline is gonna create some turbulence in there that, that helps break those, that those, those plugs up. We may have to do that. Um, so uh, it's, we wanna limit it, but it has not been done away with completely. Uh, so in sense barometers, everybody sees them. They're everywhere. Um, you will be supplying these to almost every patient you have, certainly the patients that have had surgery. Um, we, as respiratory therapists, do not follow them like we used to follow them. Um, although th the belief has kind of turned to that an incentive spirometer is a therapeutic device, it's really just a meter. So it measures things. So when you ask a patient to take a breath in on an incentive spirometer, it will measure how deeply they breathe, but it will not make them breathe more deeply, okay? So uh, you, as, as nurses, will routinely go in there and coax your patients to do this, you know, this device. If we come in, if we do this at all, it would be just to see how deeply they're breathing. So we would probably not be coming in on every patient, every 
four hours and saying do this ten times we you know we would want we would might use it as a check you know to see where we are okay um, on the other hand a device like this is what we would probably prefer to use because uh, you know like in, with our assess and treat protocol most patients were not going to choose incentive spirometry for us to come back and do with them uh, we want to do something that's actually therapeutic, something that will make them breathe more deeply, uh, will actually recruit lung. Uh, we may uh, use a device like this, which is a positive pressure device, and it, this one actually has a fluttering valve in it. So when the patient takes a, a breath in this and exhales through it, it vibrates, sending vibrations back into their chest. So that's in hopes of breaking up secretions and allowing the patient to, to cough them up, clear them on their own. So, you know, we might, after using this device, you know, periodically check the incentive spirometry to see if it's imp things are improving. Uh, so this device, um, the, uh, the Arabica, is good for uh, basically airway clearance. Uh, this EasyPap is another device uh, this one is really good at lung recruitment because we'll, we're going to hook up this this up to a gas source so when the patient takes a breath in it actually assists them in taking a deeper breath and then when they try to exhale it has back pressure so it pushes a back pressure into their lungs and hopefully pops open all those little little grapes that that are at the end of each of the airways that exchange gas okay so uh, and both these two, the last two devices I just showed you, we can actually do them in conjunction with delivering aerosolized medications as well. All right, a step up in, in our support from uh, our, our nasal cannulas and non rebreathers would be high flow nasal cannulas. The high flow nasal cannulas are becoming very popular. Um, they um, have the advantage of being the a non-invasive way of delivering the most oxygen possible. These are going to deliver 100% oxygen and 100% humidity. Uh, so you will, uh, uh, it's a very nicely conditioned gas. Uh, secretions will not thicken while this, this, is, this device is on. Uh, there are two of them here. Uh, they both do the same thing. The lower right one is just a much cleaner, uh, more high-tech way look, way of delivering, and the uh, one on the left is, um, you know, your kind of your cobble together kind kind of thing. And, and we have both. If you look at the cobble together version, um, at the very bottom, you'll you're going to see that it has a humidifier, um, and on one side of that that container. Gas goes in, gas goes out through the blue tubing, and come, goes out to, to a nasal cannula. The nasal cannula itself is a very large bore. It's just slightly smaller than your nares. And uh, it's all driven by the, uh, the, at the very top of that tree is a blender. So it does the same thing just like your blender does. It mixes things. So it's connected to air and oxygen, and it blends those two things together, and it will give you anywhere from 21% to 100% oxygen, okay? And then and there's a flow meter attached to it and that feeds the humidifier down below. Um, uh, please keep in mind, uh, I know that some people, are, nurses have been got, um, gotten very used to uh, thinking that by turning down the flow on something, they're turning down the oxygen, kind of like a nasal cannula. Sure, you're giving them less oxygen because you're giving them less, less flow, but really, the only way to turn down oxygen is to change the percentage of that oxygen. So with devices like this, in order to wean oxygen, we're not, we, don't, we don't change the flow. We change, actually change the percent of oxygen. Now, one of the nice things about this device is that um, because it works at such high flows, which can be up to 80 liters per minute, it has this constant flow and clearing of all the dead space in, in, in your airways. So that acts like that reservoir on those other devices. So when you, they try to take a breath in, they get 
only gas from the nasal cannula and the dead space that they have in their airways. Uh, and uh, that uh, it also um, works very well at uh, removing CO2 from your patient's blood because it ha acts kind of like a conveyor belt. And we have, you know, what we call laws of uh, partial pressure. You know, if you have a high CO2 in your blood and you have an airway sitting next to it that has a low uh, uh, level of CO2, it's actually going to tr uh, transfuse right over into that lower, lower side. So it'll actually pull more CO2 out of your system. It can also create a bit of CPAP. Uh, so for pa patients that uh, have uh, a mild need or have some degree of uh, uh, sleep apnea, it can help them. Um, it uh, will actually uh, help to keep your patients from getting intubated. Uh, so it's a, it's a pretty nice device. The, uh, the one on the right there, um, what the, the, one of the benefits of this one is that the blender the humidifier, uh, everything is built into that little box. Uh, another fringe benefit is that this device doesn't require uh, the uh, uh, a high pressure uh, air and oxygen. It only needs oxygen. You know, so when we're in our older section of our building, not every place has air piped in. So this device can still be used there. And what it does is it pulls in air from the room. Uh, to uh, to make to change that uh, mix, okay. Um, I think that very covers it for a high flow nasal cannula. <laughs> uh, again, very popular, and the uh, this is a device that you can keep your patients on your acute care floors with, okay. Also, uh, I just want you to be aware that. Um, Although these flows seem excessively high and you would think they were very uncomfortable, that six liters of, of on that low flow cannula are actually more uncomfortable than these high flow devices and that's because of the fact that they're cold and dry in those little cannulas. The, because this device is humidified to 100% humidity at body temperature or very close to it, it's very tolerable. It, uh, it will um, give a patient uh, a feeling of uh, resistance when they exhale. So if you as a healthy person were to exhale, it would, it would be a little uncomfortable because you're trying to breathe out while this gas is trying to rush in. But if you can imagine a patient that is actually sick and their lung is so stiff that it wants to collapse really fast and they don't really want it to collapse fast but they have no control over it. That back, resi that resistance actually will create more, uh, some comfort, you know, in, in uh, you know, nor normalizing, you know, how that recoil of the lung, okay? So up from that would be uh, a machine, something like this. This is a V60 that you might hear a, a therapist call it that. That's probably not gonna be helpful to you, but it's a BiPAP machine. Uh, this is made by Philips, and actually BiPAP is a trademark, so it's only BiPAP if it's on a Philips machine. Uh, but it, you know, the, the actual generic term would be bi-level ventilation. So it uh, will deliver a ventilation via a mask in most cases. It actually can be used for invasive ventilation, but for our purposes we'll just be talking about the masks. and. Uh, there's a couple of different kinds of masks that we have. We can just use a typical face mask that you would see, say, when you're doing a bag mask ventilation, fits something like that. Uh, uh, there's also a full face mask that would come like, uh, you know, across here, kind of like uh, divers might use or welders or something like that. Uh, there's also a new mask that you'll probably start to see that sits over the mouth and uh, just butts up against the nose, and there's actually a hole in the top of the uh, the cushion where the where the nose sits, so that that you can breathe through. And that it, it tends to be very well tolerated. Um, it uh, I think it may have the uh, benefits in those patients that feel claustrophobic, you know, when something's sitting on their face like that. Um, 
the uh, uh, another, the also the very the full mask is uh, well tolerated, and one of the reasons for that is that it's uh, again it's not sitting right here in the middle of your face, and it also uh, distributes out the pressure from the mask on a larger area. We have a lot of problems with masks that sit here on the on the bridge of the nose and getting skin breakdown there. So. Uh, we have to be very diligent about that. Also, the mask has a pad that sits on the forehead, and that can kind of cause some breakdown too. So when you're working with patients like this that may be on BiPAP or CPAP, that's one of the things you're gonna to wanna to be watching for. Not only that the mask is in place like it should be, but that we're not causing you know, skin breakdown. And you know, we can add some padding to different places, um, you know, we cannot remove the pressure completely. Um, now, one thing about this CPAP, you know, we do keep maintain patients with CPAP on uh, acute care floors, um, but we generally don't do leave BiPAP patients on those floors. The one ca caveat to that would be a patient that's on chronic um, uh, BiPAP. You know, they uh, they use it at night. And they and when they go to sleep and it and it, and it gives them breaths has backup ventilation for the, for them um, we will do that um, but in general if we place a patient on on BiPAP we may leave the patient there for a short period of time probably no more than two hours to see if we can um, correct the issue and to get them off you know because there's sometimes there are correctable problems whether it be just giving Lasix because they've been fluid overload, they're post-op and you know they haven't been fully reversed, um, you know things like that. Uh, so uh, if um, they aren't going to be able to come off in that short period of time, they're going to go to the intensive care unit. Um, now, that isn't to say that we're just going to sit there for two hours no matter what. You know they have to stabilize right from the get-go for us to leave them there. If we put them on and they don't get any better or they, they're getting worse, well, we're, they're, they're going to get moved immediately, if not intubated right then. Okay. So there's your BiPAP. Um, this pretty much comes to the close of my, of my talk, and I get to this slide that says SBAR. Uh, I am not going to teach you SBAR. This is just to punctuate the fact that we need to get clear communication from you. Um, again, as I told you earlier, the therapists are out there and could be covering a floor in the D tower and the A tower at the same time, and there's a lot of ground to cover for that. Even if they're all in the A tower, you can imagine one person that has patients on all seven floors in that building. It takes some time to get around. Um, so it's going to be helpful to both you and us if you tell us exactly what you need. It's probably not a good idea to have one of the unit secretaries or HUX uh, deliver the message because we often just get a message of come now. Well, we don't know why we're coming, so we don't know what we might need. We also don't know if your patient is more important than the other three nurses patients that called us at, at around the same time. So we need information from you so we can triage which patient we're going to come to see first and which piece of equipment we may need to bring with us. Maybe we need to bring that high flow nasal cannula or something like that. Okay, so uh, keep that in mind and uh, if uh, you know if it's a situation that um, you're not sh it, it you know you feel like it's it's really imperative then you shouldn't be calling the therapist you should be using your rapid response system you know if it's if it's that important call rapid response it's all about just getting the resources that be you believe you need there so if you need them that will get you a therapist and it gets you a critical care nurse immediately so just go ahead and do that it's okay. You know, we're trying to prevent, you know, having to escalate to a code. You know, if it's, if it's really, you know, critical, use that. Otherwise, you know, have a conversation with your therapist and we'll be able to make better decisions. Okay? So, 
thank you, and again, welcome to Providence.